All right, Alexander. So uh, here we are in uh, in the winter of 1917, and um, as we have been predicting in uh, many uh, shows that we have done, many episodes that we've uh, done covering the events uh, leading up to to this day, the Bolsheviks have now uh, seized power, and they are in control of the government. That is uh, that is how it looks at this very moment. What is going on right now in um, in Russia, in Saint Petersburg, in Moscow? Are the Bolsheviks in power? Will this uh, last? Will this hold? Mm. How did this happen? Well, indeed. How did it happen? Well, let's first of all discuss how how it happened. And in fact, as you correctly say, we predicted it. This is the inevitable outcome of a series of processes that go all the way back to the way in which the liberals, the oligarchs, those people both in parliament, in the Duma, and in the wider country, um, orchestrated an attempt to try to force the Tsar, Nicholas, to try to grant them power and to push them aside so that they could essentially take control of the country. And what that led to, if you remember, was a essentially what you might call a coup, orchestrated by the Speaker of the Parliament, uh, the Duma, uh, uh, Rodzianko, in which the generals were basically tricked into telling Nicholas to stand down whilst protests were underway in St. Petersburg, in the capital, and that resulted to, in the formation of a government in St. Petersburg, the so-called provisional government, which was not appointed by any proper institution, wasn't anchored in any institution because Nicholas offered to appoint it, but that was rejected. The idea of a successor, a new Tsar, uh, uh, Grand Prince Michael replacing him as Tsar, that was rejected as well. And the result is we had a uh, government which called itself the government, which was accepted as the government by various people around the world, that which the ministries, the officials at the ministries, you know, to some extent acknowledged as the government, but which had no fundamental legitimacy. And um, in parallel to the emergence of this government, we saw this emergence of workers and soldiers councils across Russia, and these workers and soldiers councils have fallen increasingly under the control of Lenin's organization, which is the only effective and organization, political organization, operating across Russia with, um, uh, you know, strong positions um, amongst the Russian working class, organized in the factories, with a great deal of collusion from the oligarchs who had built it up in order to put pressure on Nicholas to extract concessions from him. And what has now happened is that there's been this meeting in St. Petersburg of the first, or the second rather, the second All-Union Congress of Soviets, of councils, of these councils, uh, the Bolsheviks called it together, and it has now assumed power, and it has appointed Lenin prime minister. And he's formed a government. He doesn't like the word minister, so he's called it the Council of People's Commissars. He is the chairman of the Council of People's Commissars in Russia. The uh, the word for this is Sovnarkom, Sov Soviet Nar Nar. Uh, 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 you know the people's and Com is commissar. So, so the Sovnarkom, chaired by Lenin. It's now the government of Russia, or so it claims, appointed to that position by the Second All-Union Congress of Councils. Now, before this Congress met, um, various um, workers' militia controlled by the Bolsheviks and sailors from the Baltic fleet came into St. Petersburg and started seizing buildings and gaining control of the city. Kerensky, who was the prime minister of this provisional government, we've talked about him at considerable length, tried to organise resistance. He has antagonised every section of society. We discussed how, back in August, 
there was this attempted attempt to use the army to bring the Bolsheviks to heel, and Kerensky torpedoed it, and in fact distributed arms to the workers' militias in the city, and the military is now in total disarray and confusion, and the generals hate Kerensky anyway. So the military didn't lift a finger to defend Kerensky, and in the face of these militia taking over the city, there was essentially no resistance. The only place where there was a limited amount of resistance was in the uh, headquarters of the government, the Winter Palace, the Tsar's Palace in St. Petersburg, which Kerensky, in my opinion, very unwisely made the base of his government. He should have stuck in the usual place where the government of Russia is located, which is the Marinsky Palace, which is some distance away, but he transferred the government to the Winter, to the Winter Palace. He put together, he was able to cobble together some units made up of officers and officer cadets to defend the Winter Palace. There's also a battalion of women soldiers, which is, was, you know, has provoked some derision in Russia. These people put up only a marginal, perfunctory resistance. The militias and the Baltic sailors broke into the palace with great ease, rounded up the defenders, arrested all the ministers, and, of course, at that point, it turned out that Kerensky himself had fled. So the result is that Lenin is now in control of St. Petersburg. He's been formally appointed to this post by the Second All-Russia Congress of Councils. And the word is that councils up and down Russia, these councils up and down Russia, are now recognising his government and he has an organisation that stretches from one end of Russia to the other. It's not clear how much pop popular support he has. But unlike Kerensky's government, he has military forces in St. Petersburg, which are loyal to him. He's got military forces in Moscow, which are loyal to him. There's been some more resistance, I should say, to this takeover in Moscow. More resistance than in St. Petersburg, but... It looks as if that won't last for very long. And he's got an organisation all over Russia. And my own personal view, and this is one which I know the foreign embassies aren't accepting, but my own personal view is that this government is a lot more solid than Kerensky's. It's anchored in an institution, which are the workers' councils, um, unlike um, Kerensky's government, which is anchored in no institution at all, but which is wholly self-appointed. This institution, the Workers' Councils, does have some support amongst the wider population, at least in the cities. It's backed by force, these Red Guards, as they're now called, these workers' militia that Lenin has organised, and it's got a man at its head, Lenin, who is utterly ruthless, completely focused, focused on power. I think this government is going to be in power for a very long time, unless it is overthrown very fast. And at the moment, the attempts to try to overthrow it, which are being made, look extremely disorganised. That was going to be my question, actually, is if you consider this to be... Uh, a, a coup d'etat or, you know, a, a, a revolution. Okay, you could say it is a revolution, but if you consider it to actually be a, a coup because you are looking at the overthrow or the replacement of a government that had no legitimacy to begin with and a government that came to power by tricking, in essence, tricking the czar to abdicate. So, it's it's really a strange situation what yes. you have now. Um, you know, you you do have a, a more stable structure, the ruthless a ruthless structure, but a stable structure filling the uh, the vacuum of of a structure that was completely unstable and illegitimate. Uh, you have a legitimate stable structure filling the structure yes. of, of something that was uh, uh, 
uh, unstable and illegitimate. I- is this a coup? I mean, it, well, or is this, or was this the natural progression of things? Yes. Uh, because I, I don't want to make it. I don't want to trivialize it, but it does seem like once the Bolsheviks and Lenin had all their uh, everything in order, all their uh, all their yeah. pieces in place, the final piece, which was actually taking control of of the government, came pretty pretty easily. It dropped into their hands. I mean, this is the thing. I mean, there's. I mean, you, you're already hearing stories about the storming of the Winter Palace and vast numbers of people, you know, fighting and seizing the palace. It's been nothing like that. St. Petersburg, actually, believe it or not, has been reasonably quiet over the last couple of hours. There's this meeting of this uh, Congress of Councils in the Smolny, which is, by the way, a former high school, (laughs) but uh, which is, you know, where where Lenin has now been formally appointed uh, prime minister. And as I said, there's been these workers' militia groups that have been moving around the city. But, you know, we're not talking about large groups of armed men. We're not talking about vast numbers of people on the streets. I would say this is a coup within a coup. The actual coup, the real coup, was the one that was orchestrated by the liberals, the oligarchs back in March, and which forced Nicholas to abdicate. From that moment, legitimacy in Russia essentially collapsed because there were no institutions left from the previous system, no elected institutions, no monarchical institutions left, which could actually command legitimacy amongst the wider population. And as you correctly said, this is a very rickety, illegitimate structure that was put in its place, far more rickety and illegitimate than I think the liberals ever really understood or imagined or the oligarchs ever really understood and imagined. And how much support and legitimacy the Bolsheviks and their councils actually have across the country is a good question, but at least they have some. And in a contest with a government that had essentially none and had managed to lose whatever support it had across the country, it's not surprising in a way that Lenin found it so easy to take control. I mean, essentially, Power has dropped into his hands. Obviously, he's, if you think of it as a fruit, he's shaken the tree a little. And, you know, he's very good at that. But as I said, it's dropped into his hands because there is no real organised force across the country in any kind of position to resist him. Now, I mean, I ought to say there are many, many people in Russia who are appalled by what is happening. Um And there will, I am sure, be some attempt over the next few months to try to roll this back. But one should never underestimate the force of Lenin's personality, his focus, his ruthlessness, his enormous organisational skills, and the fact that he now has a very strong organisation behind him. He's not going to give power easily give up power easily. And now he's in control. And, you know, I suspect that he's going to try and hold on to power for all it's worth. And the other side looks weak, disorganized and chaotic. And yes, some soldiers and officers, perhaps from the Tsarist army, will want to respond. But already one gets the sense that generally, A lot of the people who worked for the Tsar, I'm talking about not, you know, the higher aristocracy, I'm talking about the bureaucracy, the people in the ministries, many of the officers in the the army, are relieved that at least Russia has what looks like a real government again. So, you know, I, I, I wouldn't discount the possibility that he will survive and win out. And in fact, if I had to put my money on it, I'd say he he will. So where do we go from here? Um, yeah. Does uh, does Russia exit the war? Um, yes. Does Lenin yes. pull out Russia from the war? Uh, who's going to be uh, running yeah. the the government and the various institutions? Are we going to be looking at people like Trotsky and Stalin yes. in yes. very high positions? Uh, That's exactly. How does how do the Bolshevik how do the Bolsheviks secure such a large uh, territory, such a large yeah. uh, land mass? I mean, right. that, that's quite a challenge as well. I mean, you're, you're talking Saint Petersburg and Moscow, but you know, we've yeah. got this this huge 
uh, territory known as yeah. uh, as Russia. How do they yes. how do they rule over that? And uh, the final question is, what what kind of government is this going to be? Yes. I mean, is, yeah. is it going to have Marxist uh, underpinnings? And, and what does that mean? I right. mean? Are we looking at a new system? Yeah, we're looking at a new system. We're looking at a Marxist government and one with an incredibly radical vision for the country. And I think that's the first thing to say. Who's going to run this government? Lenin has appointed himself or has been appointed prime minister. He's the prime minister, the chair of this Council of People's Commissars. By the way, we're told that all officials of this government from now on are not to be referred to as officials. They're to be called commissars. And already, by the way, they're adopting a kind of fashion style. They're all dressing in leather jackets and things like that. The only exception is Lenin himself, who is always goes around in a three-piece. He's very conservative, strangely enough, in his, uh, in his um, fashion sense and in his way of speaking. And he's an odd mixture of things in that regard. But no, it's going to be a very radical government. And the people who are going to be appointed to it are radicals. They're people from Lenin's organisation. So Stalin will certainly be there. And Trotsky is going to be appointed foreign minister. At least that's the original, the, the first position. And to be very clear, Trotsky's role is to end the war. I mean, Lenin is absolutely clear. He wa He's not interested in the war. He has no desire to achieve any great... Uh, uh, victory in the war. He realises that Russia can't win the war. He realises that the attempt to win a war uh, at the moment with the army in chaos is hopeless. So he's going to try and secure peace with the Germans. And the very first, he made two decrees. The first is the decree of, for peace. He says that he's issued a decree for peace, which essentially means capitulation to the Germans. I mean, some kind of negotiated settlement with the Germans. And the other points to the way forward. It's a decree on land, which basically nationalizes land and distributes it to the peasants. So that's that's what he's going. That's his program. Those are his two very first decrees. He announced them literally from the podium in the Congress when it, he was elected prime minister of Russia. So that's what he's going to do. Now, can he hold things together? I'm going to say this. He's got workers' councils, which are accepting his uh, government all over Russia. We're getting more and more reports that from every city in Russia, the workers' councils are assuming control and they're recognizing Lenin as the prime minister, as the head of this government. Remember, all these workers' councils are essentially controlled by Lenin's organization. And we also understand that the military, for the moment, are recognizing Lenin's government, and the staff in the ministries are recognizing Lenin's government. Um, Kerensky, after he left the city, tried to get some military units uh, he, uh, to move on to St. Petersburg to regain control there. He appointed a general called Krasnov to take charge. That failed almost before it started. The military are not interested in supporting Kerensky. So far as they can see, Lenin at the moment is the only word, the only game in town. So he's got all of that behind him. But, as you rightly say, he faces enormous problems. Now, I think this government will survive unless foreign intervention happens in a way that leads to its overthrow. Len Russia is still at war. So much depends on what the Germans do. Do they work along with Lenin, who, after all, they facilitated his arrival in St. Petersburg? Do they sign a peace with him? Or do they march all the way to St. Petersburg and Moscow and try to take over control themselves? I think they will try to work with Lenin. I think their priority is to, do, to achieve some kind of peace in Russia so that they can transfer their army to the Western Front and launch an, uh, an offensive there and try to win the war in the West before the Americans arrive, which they're expected to do in the spring and summer of, uh, of 1918. So I think that's what the Germans are going to do. Um, but the other question is, 
what do the Allied powers do? Because, of course, the British and the French, and to some extent the US, have now lost a key ally, or are about to lose a key ally, which is Russia. Will they try to reverse this change of power that's happened in uh, Russia? And already you hear stories and reports that the British and the French and even the US are thinking of sending troops to Russia to try to restore some kind of control there and to uh, get the kind of people that they want back into power. The, the, the risk that runs is that with the British and the French, with the Allies focused overwhelmingly, it seems to me, on holding the Germans in the Western Front, the number of troops they will send to Russia will be far too few to really gain control of the situation in Russia. And their presence is going to allow Lenin, who is a propagandist of genius, to say that he's not merely um, seeking the socialist re-transformation of Russia, but that he is defending Russia from the capitalist powers which are trying to reimpose capitalism, break up Russia, perhaps bring Nicholas back, and that may gain traction. So this, if there's going to be this intervention, it needs to be very carefully thought through and handled. And to be honest, I think that the British and the French, especially, who are so distracted, so focused on winning the war against the Germans, are not going to be able to do this at anything like the level that's needed to defeat Lenin and his organisation anytime fast. Now, we'll see what happens. I mean, the next year is going to be crucial. If Lenin's government is still intact in a year's time, then I think the chances of it surviving become ever greater, in which case, I think, personally that it will be a very, very long time before it falls. What happens to, uh, what's happened to the, the elite class, the royal class, the, the people that were, uh, you know, uh, living it up in St. Petersburg and in Moscow, the royal family, uh, people who were related to the Tsar, what's happened to them, the princes and... Uh, and uh, their families and all of these people. What uh, what's happened to the um, oligarchs? What's going to happen yeah. to them? Well, these my oligarchs that my uh, we're trying to, to seize control. What about Kerensky? And finally, what about the Tsar? What's what's going on with all these people that we've been right. discussing yeah. over uh, this time period? What's what's going to happen to them now? Right, the Tsar's prospects look extremely grim. As I said, he's been a prisoner with his family of the provisional government. I mean, you know, they, they, they've had him under arrest. It seems the guards have now recognised Lenin's government. And as we've discussed in the past, Lenin's an utterly ruthless man. It's very difficult to see him having any uh, time or interest in Nicholas. I, I have to say, I, I, I fear the worst for Nicholas and for his family. And uh, Nicholas, if he's got moments of self-reflection, which I'm sure he does. I think he's, a, as I said before, a very, very uh, intelligent and well-informed man. I think he must be deeply regretting the decision that he took back in March when Rodzianko and the military persuaded him to abdicate because he's now put his family and himself in a, period, in a position of extraordinary danger. He's also seeing Russia on the brink of defeat in this war. Um, he must be extremely concerned about what's going to happen to the country, but he's powerless to do anything about it. So, you know, one has to worry about his fate. One has to worry about the family's fate. I, I, I have to say their lives now hang by a thread. And, well, we'll see what happens. As for all the others, the princes, the Romanovs, the various aristocrats, the liberals, the oligarchs. My advice to them is very simple. Get out fast, <laughs> because the longer Lenin is in charge, the grimmer your fate is going to be. Any one of you who thinks that the, the Bolsheviks, if they gain control, if they consolidate control, 
aren't going to come after you eventually. Uh, I, I mean, you're being delusional. That's my own personal advice. Now, most of them are still there. They're still in St. Petersburg and in Moscow and in other cities. But um, um, it's absolutely clear that these people who just a few months ago were the governing class of Russia have no power, no control. They're not in control of the situation any longer. The man who is in control is Lenin. He's back with an utterly dis ruthless and disciplined organization, and he has absolutely no time for them. You only have to look at his book. He published his book in over the course of the summer, The State and Revolution, about the kind of vision for the country that he has. It's an unalloyed socialist vision. He has no time or place for them at all. He's a, in some ways, uh, a, a pragmatic man, he might conceivably do deals, you know, which recognize private property rights as part of a pathway towards his socialist ideal system. But even if he does that, be under no, no doubt about it, it won't be the oligarchs or the liberals or the aristocracy that he will work with. It will be new people who are ultimately controlled by himself. So that's the reality. I was, as I said, I would strongly advise them to get out fast. If they don't, then within a few weeks' time, they will start to see uh, at Lenin's people, the militia that he controls, knocking at their door, and they will very quickly find themselves under arrest. And with a, a very grim, so, he, uh, a very grim fate awaiting them. <laughs> yeah, get get out of town quick. Um, yeah. So, uh, what is this this new government? What is this? Uh, what does it mean to to have a government, uh, a socialist Marxist government? Do you have any idea? I mean, you well, said this is it. You've, this uh, is the, you've taken a look at his book, at Lenin's book. Yeah, uh, what yeah, what well, exactly is he talking about? Yeah, well, absolutely. I mean, I think I should say this is the first socialist government that we've ever seen anywhere in the world, at least on this kind of scale. What does it mean? Well, he's made it very clear. First of all, he wants nationalization of property. I mean, this is the, I mean, he, he wants to establish essentially a, 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 an economic system which is based on state planning and state control of the economy. I mean, he's he's a clever man. I mean, he's got a, in some ways, a kind of technocratic vision, but it's one which allows no scope for private property rights, in which there is a, going to be a major drive for a complete restructuring of society. State is going to run things. He's going to run things. Um, there's going to be an attempt to equalize everybody around the country. And um, there's going to be a massive reform or change or revolution in social relations and uh, a mechanization of agriculture. That's his ultimate vision. Mechanization of agriculture, uh, a forced industrialization of the country, all controlled from the center or run through central planning. And of course, uh, um, he's going to completely do away with religion. He's got no time for religion at all. He's extremely hostile to religion. He's, and you know, this conservative, agricultural peasant society which Russia has been for most of the last you know hundred years, it's going to be transformed out of all recognition, and the culture that underpinned it is under, you know, enormous threat. I would say Lenin himself is a very, very cultured man. I mean, he reads, he's read all the all of Russian literature. He read Tolstoy, Dostoevsky. He likes classical music. But, you know, that's not going to stand in the way of the vision he wants to achieve. So you're going to see new styles of architecture, new styles of economic organisation, new systems of social uh, organisation, and all of it under pervasive state control of a sort and of a type that we have never seen in any other country in the world. You said equalization of society. Equalization of society. That's what so that's exactly right. So the idea is basically uh, private property is going to be abolished. The state uh, is going to... Con 
classes. I mean, his ultimate conception, his ultimate goal is a society which, in which there are no classes, but his ideological concept is that this is going to be a state run by the workers, the working class run by their vanguard organisation, which is the Bolshevik Party. So instead of people, you know, a, an arrangement of society around, you know, education, business, those sort of things, it's going to be a party-run system controlled by the party which will run the country on behalf of the working class. So that's, that's his one, vision. One party. One party. Oh, no, no, there's no real... No, no indeed. Parties. I mean, there's no real room for other parties in this in this system. I mean, at the moment, I mean, they haven't been abolished and he's... Or in fact, he's even gone into coalition with a breakaway group from the Socialist Revolutionary Party called the, Le the Left SRs. But, I mean, ultimately, it's impossible to see um, uh, Lenin <laughs> coexisting with any particular other party. I mean, his conception, as I said, is very much... The communist, the Bolshevik Party. He's already starting to call it the Communist Party. By the way, apparently he wants to rename it at some point. The Bolshevik Party. It's going to be the overall party that's going to run everything on behalf of the workers. It's to some extent a technocratic vision. I mean, he believes in experts. As I said, he's an educated man, but it's going to be a technocratic vision. Uh, um, a um, authoritarian vision. Some would call it, you know, there's already some people in Italy who are coming up with this concept of totalitarianism, if you like, a totalitarian vision. And the other thing I ought to say is that this is supposed to act as a um, vanguard for a world revolution, not just in Russia, but certainly across Europe, with similar structures established right across Europe as well, especially in Germany, which is the country that Lenin is most focused upon. So um, a system run by Lenin through the Communist Party on behalf of the workers, no, uh, uh, no um, um, concept of you know, proper elections or anything of that kind, uh, no multi-party system, um, no private property relations to any great extent, or if they do exist, under in an intensely controlled environment, and all of them heading ultimately to this communist ideal of a system without classes, without property, um, in which, as Lenin likes to say, everyone supposedly will have all they need um, um, uh, every, to everyone uh, from uh, to to each to each according to their needs and from everyone according to their abilities. So everybody is supposed to produce to the extent that they're able to, and everybody will be uh, satisfied according to their needs. This is Lenin's concept. How he's going to get there is a big question. But as I said, he's a strange mixture of the intensely practical. And the utopian is a he, he's somebody who, as I said, who has a very odd mixture of uh, 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 of ideas. But, you know, uh, ultimately, there is a very, very ruthless drive for power. And he's now achieved it. And then, as I said, I think he's going to hold on to it. And I think anybody who thinks he's going to be prized out of power easily is deeply mistaken. Yeah. Uh, a government run by Lenin, um, governed from the center with experts uh, dictating to an equalized society of people. Yes, yes. This, yes. this is going to be the this, this new uh, Absolutely. practical utopia, as, practical as you put utopia. it. Absolutely. I mean, one of the things I'm actually to, just to give an example, I mean, there's already talk that, you know, Russia has a housing problem. I mean, and, you know, when I say that, I mean, it really does. And um, some of the conditions in which workers live in uh, Russia, you know, are extremely grim. And the oligarchs were n who ran Russia were never interested in the 
conditions of their workers. And we were very resistant to this. So you don't have, like you have in, say, countries like the United States and Britain, people, you know, b factory owners building uh, homes and housing estates for their workers. There's been nothing really like that in Russia. So the conditions of many of these workers are really very, very grim. Well, Lenin's solution to all of this is to get them out of these barracks and these awful slums and to house them in the flats and apartments and homes of the bourgeoisie. So he's going to, he's going to, as he says, he's going to sort of put the workers in there. The, the middle class, the bourgeoisie are going to be, still be there, but, you know, they're going to have to share their flats with people from the, uh, from the, um, working class and of course that will level them down because they'll be having to live alongside workers and workers families and that's going to be I, just, I suspect extremely traumatic for many of them I mean just imagine you know a whole lot of people being imposed on you in your home but that's already something that Lenin is you know working towards doing and um, of course that also means that middle class people are going to be under continuous surveillance because, of course, with workers there, with workers, you know, part of this new system, and with many of them obviously under Bolshevik control, they'll be able to keep close observation on middle class people. And that's just one example of what's coming. Very radical. Very yeah. radical indeed. Yeah. Yeah. I wonder and how of course, the world is looking on to this. Well, indeed. I, I would say, by the way, that within the Bolshevik Party, um, Lenin himself is almost a moderate on some issues. I mean, there are some people, for example, you know, there's a, there's a, um, a rather fiery um, uh, uh, woman um, um, activist, Alexandra Kolomtai, who is actually an aristocrat, but she joined the Bolshevik Party. She's got some extremely radical ideas. She believes in free love. She thinks that, uh, um, you know, um, there should be um, free love between men and women. There shouldn't be marriage. They, she believes essentially in the abolition of marriage. And there's already concepts, you know, that housing, people should uh, share all facilities. There's already talk about creating new housing systems where, um, um, you know, there will be separate apartments for workers and everybody, but, you know, the uh, bathrooms and kitchens and things and dining areas will be communal. Now, Lenin himself doesn't like that kind of thing. He's a bit more conservative. He thinks that's going too far. But there are a lot of people who actually do think like that. And, you know, they're, they're, they get there's a big head of steam building up behind it. And they have a lot of support within parts of the... Um, artistic intelligentsia. There's a sort of Russian avant-garde, people like Tatlin and the constructivists who believe, you know, that, uh, and uh, Malevich and the suprematists. I mean, they basically want to sort of, I mean, they, their conception is a year, a year zero in terms of art and culture. They want to see pretty much everything sort of torn down and started again, all in a high modernist style with uh, um, a completely different sort of physical space. Lenin, as I said, is an odd mixture of conservative and extreme radical, just as he wears a three-piece suit. <laughs> he doesn't apparently like some of this avant-garde art that he sees, and he's apparently not keen on free love or any of that kind of thing. But, you know, we'll see, we'll see what he does. So, as I said, ultimately, it's all about power with him. And, I mean... As I said, there may be people even more radical than he is, but in terms of his programme, he's very, very radical indeed already. Yeah, once you've let the uh, genie out, it's really hard to uh, put it back in, once you've let it out of the bottle. Absolutely. It's going to be hard to put these ideas back in. Absolutely. Even Absolutely. for Lenin. Absolutely, even for Lenin. but even yeah. for Lenin. I would say, by the way, I mean, you know, you find people in the West... Who are very, you know, very excited by all this new art that's come pouring out of Russia, and um, and some of it is, you know, I, I'm going to say straightforwardly. I mean, some of it's absolutely remarkable. I mean, the Russians have made this huge leap into abstract art, for example, which, well, you get some people um, in Western Europe who've dabbled with this idea, but nothing like to the extent that, say, Malevich is doing in Russia. And this art is 
remarkable. But I think when they talk about it, they're, they're not aware of the political radicalism that underpins it and the kind of totalitarian conceptions that underpin it as well. And, I, you know, I think there's some talk about, you know, this is, you know, we should allow this, this is free uh, expression and all of that. But people like Tatlin, Rodchenko, uh, Malevich, they're not into free expression at all. They want to see a complete artistic reorganisation of society. They have no time for old-style art, they want to replace it with this new style art, which is going to be symptomatic of the new society. And that, you know, the, the, this is visual art, but it's also expressed in music. There's a very, some very interesting and very remarkable musical experiments also going underway, uh, underway, which is going to, you know, radically change the way music sounds and um, dance um, and at every conceivable level, as I said, it, for these people, what they want is year zero. <laughs> and I think that's I think it's a point which people need to understand. They want everything that existed before pushed aside so that they can create this new utopia, which isn't going to be just a transformation in social and economic relations as Lenin wants, but it's going to be a transformation of family an abolition of family as we conceived of it, and a completely different architecture, art, music, to, to a degree that, as I said, it's impossible, I think, for many people in the West to really conceive. And, of course, just to re reiterate again, none of these people has any role for religion in this in this in this system i mean religion is going to be completely done away with the idea is that uh, um you we all have to be materialists and that you know we accept the world as it is by the way i ought to say one thing i must make so one point i should make about lenin is that you have all these people who talk about narratives and who talk about uh, um um how um visual what we see is f formed by our minds and the world we see isn't objective reality lenin himself absolutely hates all of that sort of thing he has no time for the phenomenon of what's sometimes called cultural marxism he, he detests it what he wants is something much more radical even than that he says there is objective reality and i know what it is and I'm going to impose it on you. And that's what he's going to do. That's his conception of what the future is. So he he knows what objective reality is and he's going to impose it. And what that means, by the way, if you think about it, is that, of course, he can't allow religion to exist in any real sense. Because, of course, that is an alternative. That is an alternative way of thought and idea and philosophy and religion to the one that Lenin has, and of course it conceivably creates an alternative system of loyalties to the party and to Lenin and to the political structure that he's creating. No, there is objective reality. It's just that Lenin decides what that objective exactly. reality is. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. That, exactly. It. And it's important exactly. to get the artists on board. You have to get the absolutely. artists. Oh, uh, absolutely. Oh, he's on very, board very. Going to reshape the culture. Yeah, you, you have to get them to uh, to buy into it as well. So, absolutely. Yeah. And, and I, I, you look at Malevich. You, you look at Malevich. You know art piece and and you understand exactly what year zero is absolutely. when you look at his work. Yeah, it says yes. it all. Absolutely. I mean, he's already talking about, a, you know, a, a, a cultural revolution. You know, the expression cultural revolution is already uh, uh, being bandied around. And the man he's looking to sort of organize all of this is a man called Lunacharsky, who is going to be commissar for culture and enlightenment. <laughs> I mean, that tells you, you know, it's the enlightenment part, which is perhaps the revealing one, because that tells you, exa again, exactly what... Uh, 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 Malevich, 
uh, and uh, Tatlin and Rodchenko and all of these people are going to be recruited for. And by the way, Lenin is enormously interested in cinema. Cinema is for him the most important art uh, uh, system of art of all because, of course, he sees that again as moulding society, promoting a... <laughs> loyalty to his vision of the future, which isn't, as I said, as far as he's concerned, it's not the vision. He, it is his objective reality, which is going to be imposed on everybody else. So the, the tree you touch exists. The world we see is the world we all see. He's, you know, completely against all this idea of you know, shaping things. He doesn't like all this talk, you know, march through the institutions, of, you know, this, he, he, that that's not part of his conception at all there is objective reality he knows what it is and he's going to impose it on everybody all right uh well a lot to take in okay we will uh we will leave it there everybody uh the durant.locals.com take care <laughs>